Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, my name is John Yushai. I'm from the YouTube team. I'm so excited to be joined by Alan Masaryk, who's the CEO and co-founder of Quick Office, which got a nice little shout out today at uh, the keynote. Um, and we're here to talk about and answer one question, but really just dive into the nitty gritty, and that is, after you've designed and developed a product, how do you distribute it? How do you get it out there? And hopefully we could share Alan's journey, but also help provide some insights in getting your products and apps out there when the time comes. Uh, so Alan, so good to have you. Thank you for thanks, joining us. Thanks for having me, John. I appreciate it. Awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Quick Office? I know it's definitely saved me when I've been on the road trying to change an app, try to get it on a last minute deadline. Uh, so you've definitely helped me there, but talk about how your product has helped thousands upon millions of people um, every day. Okay, so, so um, you know, the company, uh, we pivoted a bit from our initial founding back in 02, but in, by 05, we had settled on sort of this mobile office play. Um, and for those of you unfamiliar with the product, Quick Office was, a, was architected to be compatible with Microsoft Office, but on mobile. And what that meant is that if you had any Word, PowerPoint, or Excel file, and ultimately in you know, 2003, 2007, 2010 formats, you could open it into the Quick Office data model. We had full editing features, and you could round trip it back. And when you opened it, you could render it faithfully so that the paragraphs looked the way they were supposed to, uh, the PowerPoint looked the way it was supposed to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the market opportunity for us was that Microsoft had restricted Office in mobile just to the Windows platform. And so we started back way back in 05 in the Symbian platform. And back then, we all forget today, it had 80% of the world's smartphones. Uh, and then obviously it lost its share relative to iOS and Android. Um, but we ported to iOS and Android from Symbian back in the day. So as John was saying, you know, you got to start with a really good product, you got to design it, and you got to develop it. But that's only half the battle. So at the end of the day, Distribution is what set Quick Office apart and where we, we really won from. We ultimately shipped on a preloaded basis with the handset manufacturer on 500 million units, starting back in the Symbian days. So where we sole sourced Nokia and all of Symbian, but Symbian was largely Nokia, um, we later had about two thirds of all Android volume because we had direct relationships with Samsung and HTC and Motorola and Amazon on the Kindle Fire and Barnes and Noble on the Nook, et cetera, et cetera. In every instance, we always shipped our product branded. So it was always branded Quick Office. And so while we never had an embed relationship with Apple, um, our brand was extremely well known and people needed office support in mobile. And so we did extraordinarily well in on Apple, initially on the iPhone, and then later on the iPad. I mean, as the smartphone market was growing and growing, we were doing very well, but then enter the tablet, and now you had a, a canvas which was large, large enough where you're going to do real work while mobile, and we just took off. So that's kind of the story, and I can sort of share with you other things on the distribution, but really a key attribute for us was getting in people's hands. Absolutely, and I, and I think it's so interesting. You mentioned multiple different platforms there, Nokia, the uh, Apple Store, Android, and I think the amazing thing about the Quick Office story is that you've survived for so many, I mean, even Palm Pilot back in the day, yep. you've been around for so many ebbs and flows in the industry as we've moved from mobile phones to smartphones, and so how, what's been the key of, of continuing to put the Quick Office brand and product out there, though the platform has shifted so many times? Well, I, I think that, you know, if I was to advise entrepreneurs, it's, you know, when our companies are small, you've got to, you know, kind of hitch your wagon to people that, to big, I always like to refer to them as big brother partners who care whether you live or die, you know, as a business. And so, in the earliest days, we cut a deal with Nokia, and, and quite frankly, you know, some of this was a bit of luck. Um, we'd started in Palm, but then, produced a Symbian version in the early days. We happened to be headquartered in Dallas, and Nokia's US headquarters was in were in Dallas, and we created some relationships there and cut this deal where we built Quick Office into the Symbian stack itself. So if you built a Symbian device, we came with automatically. What was really important is that what we forget back then, there was no frictionless path to get to the customer like there is today with the iTunes store or with Play. Um, you know, back then there were hundreds and hundreds of little small app companies, but there was really no good aggregation in order to, you know, build a brand or build name recognition uh, 
for a globally distributed product. So while the smartphone market is far larger today than it was in 2005, it was still a big globally distributed market back then. So the deal we cut with, and you know, so it's shipping to the four corners of the globe. We're a little company. We don't have the marketing budget in order to build awareness all over in multiple languages. So we built in, they were actually languages, they required us to localize in 55 languages because they ship throughout the world. And we cut a kind of a sweetheart deal with Nokia where we gave them the viewer, you know, ours is a viewer and an editor. We gave them the viewer for a really cheap price. But the quid pro quo of that deal was that we could serve up our editor to the device anywhere in the world. So all of a sudden we had sort of solved this distribution conundrum which had tripped up all these other mobile companies no one had scale. You know, back then there were hundreds of little tiny mobile companies, and we're back there again, there are hundreds of little tiny mobile companies, or thousands, but there are hundreds of little tiny mobile companies. I, there was like nobody with more than a million dollars in revenue because you couldn't scale. There was no way to get distribution. So that embed deal changed that. Um, and actually we were able to go finance on the back of that. And sorry for the long-winded answer, no, no. but we went okay. to Mayfield, and when we did our first institutional round in the spring of 05, and so Mayfield's tier one firm, and the bet was there were X, you know, tens and tens of millions of smartphones out there. If we could get, you know, 1% of them to up, of, the, of the user to upgrade to the editor, we were going to build a big revenue base. So that was the bet. And we scaled with Symbian, but, you know, Symbian has had its challenges. It just ultimately was more or less replaced. But then we went, we realized that quickly we better jump on the iOS train and jump on the Android train, and we did hard. And which again had its own complications and costs to it, because we had, for Android we had to rebuild in effect, because it was a Java code base versus a C++ code base. But then we replicated the exact same distribution model and cut the same type of distribution deals with the manufacturers. Made a big difference. And you know when you're when you're embedded, in, you know I go back to this notion about Big Brother partnerships. They've got to ship that smartphone with office support. You know, what do you do when you get an email attachment? You gotta have office support. So they cared whether we lived or died. So that made a big help for us as we scale. So that's kind of an overview. That's awesome. So Alan, take me through the details of, of the negotiation. You talk about these big brother partners, but when you're when you're sitting across the table from them and they're like, no, Alan, we think we want to rebrand quick office to be yep. Uh, you know, more of our platform play. No, we don't like that rev share. We think you should take less. We have more of a distribution network. How do you how do you fight against that when you're just a startup uh, beginning and and, right. and and how do you push back and get the deals that you did to put you in the place to yeah, so, make the exit? Yeah, so I mean, John, that question is is um, a really important one because when we're early in our company's development, there's all these moments of truth, you know, that start early. Ours was initially with Nokia. Nokia was like. We're not branding this Quick Office. We don't know who the hell Quick Office is. And we fought back, and what's kind of ironic, the way we ultimately convinced them to brand it Quick Office was to protect their downside. Basically, if our application wasn't very good, people would be, their customer would be blaming us as the app company as opposed to them as the device manufacturer. Um, and once we were branded there, and again, that was a big pushback, but we really fought hard to make sure that we were branded Quick Office. Once you get the first big one, and Nokia was the 900-pound gorilla back in the day, then with each successive deal, you know, like the first, the next, the Android deal was HTC. HTC did not have a lot of market power when they were doing the very first Android phone. They did the G1 for Google and then did their own devices. So this is a very nascent market. It was an easier discussion in order to get our brand there. And then, you know, you build momentum and then the brand is actually a high quality and they want the brand on the device because then it conveys high quality for the phone. The other side in terms of partnering to your question with the handset manufacturer is, you know, we're, when we would preload the viewer, we want the end user to upload, to, you know, on a sort of, from the, from the end user's perspective, it's a freemium. We're trying to get them to download the premium, which is generally the editor. Um, how we can get the big brother partner, the, the OEM, to partner with us was really, really important because if you could get the UI uh, kind of a warm and welcome, you know, warm and welcoming sort of UI so that it prompted somebody to want to buy the editor, our conversion rates were much, much higher. And so 
we cut deals with all these guys where we would give them a percentage of the upside of that you know, editor upgrade in exchange for letting us do things like point of need uh, updating. Meaning when someone tried to edit and they only had a viewer, it would prompt them to say, you don't have those rights, here's the purchase mechanism to get them. Those little things made a huge amount of difference for us to continue to sell you know, the editors. And ultimately, from a distribution point of view, we did not want to be an OEM software company because the VC community, no one values an OEM software company very high because you're always going to get pressure on pricing over time. And we got some of that, although it was pretty sticky on the way down. We wanted to build relationships with the end user. And so over time, you're seeding the market. Our revenues were OEM were much higher than our revenues to the end user, but then the end user far outstripped the OEM. So it's like planting that Trojan horse yeah. made a huge difference. Um, and so by the time we sold in 2012, um, our end user revenues were double our OEM revenues and, and growing much more quickly. Alan, was there an example of, of an OEM that you were really excited to partner with to expand your distribution network who you know, maybe didn't go so well? Maybe there's a glitch in the negotiation. Is, is there a story you could share? Well, the, uh, I guess uh, one quick story on that is HP. You know, we had, uh, when Palm was still independent, Palm had their old operating system and then they developed the web OS. Uh, and they released some of their own products. Um, this is back at the time when Motorola was coming out with the early Android products, and Palm just, wouldn't, just didn't get traction. It's sort of interesting. It came down to literally Verizon putting more marketing dollars behind Moto's Droid program than Palm's program on WebOS. So they had to sell, and they sold HP. Yeah. So we cut a phenomenal deal with HP, we thought, because we were like believers in WebOS. And... Um, for those of you who have you know, been around you know, just three, four years, HP put a ton of dough behind it, huge release, this thing's going to be the greatest thing in the world, it's going to displace iOS, and six weeks into the launch, they killed the entire program. So we contractually protected ourselves, but, uh, so we, we didn't get too hurt money-wise, but it was, uh, it was a problem, you, know, you made, a, made a wrong bet. We bet on an OS that didn't survive. Now we made a lot of smart bets, uh, and I always say, you know, you're just trying to, you know, you're trying to bet or bat, excuse right. me, bat, B-A-T, with a high batting average. You're not going to win them all. That's right. That's right. So, Alan, do you, is there, uh, you've had so much experience distributing, uh, like, had your ups and downs, more ups, obviously, than, than downs. But is there something that you see nowadays that really frustrates you when you see a great product that's just sitting on the shelves that, that you think young entrepreneurs and product developers should think about in trying to get their product out? Uh, yeah, I think I think the um, um, you know that there's a tightrope we always have to walk as underfunded entrepreneurs, and that's between building our community, building our user base, and revenue. And you know, frequently, you know, there's sort of this bias that we got to generate revenue in order to get interest from the investor community, but that sort of cuts both ways. And so it's how you go through. Um, and, and, and build distribution in as obstacle-free a way as you can because, you know, those first couple million dollars of revenue are going to look awfully thin if they don't scale really quickly, you know, versus if you've got 20 million users. And so the challenge all the time is how you can, you know, be as obstacle-free as possible in order to build that community. And you see it in the social web all the time in social networks. Um, more business-oriented apps that we were, prosumer-focused apps, you know, a little different. I mean, I, I used to think back all the time when we were developing some new products about if we could give the editor for free, we would kill it. But I couldn't figure out where we were going to monetize in the back end. And um, I still sometimes think back about that. Maybe we should have done the editor for free and just kind of thrown caution to the wind because we would have had mammoth penetration because Microsoft basically left this market open for us. You know, there was one example back when the Kindle Fire came out. We, they paid us a one-day, you know, it wasn't that much money, uh, a one-day free sale, kind of all you can eat. Wow. You know, on Kindle Fire, there were, I think, four or five million units outstanding at the time. Our app, that one day, was downloaded 325,000 times. Wow. And we made peanuts on a per-unit basis, but it, you know, it helped us in a whole bunch of other ways. 
but um, you know, free and things like that, you know, really move the needle. Kind of, you know, we we played, did all sorts of alpha, you know, A B, a, B testing on pricing, and ours was a very high priced app. But um, even if you took it down to 99 cents, the difference between 99 cents and free was still, you know, stunningly different. Um. Alan, it seems like you've championed the freemium model. You talk a lot about the viewer, the editor, and talking about upselling the user. Do you feel like the freemium model has its place in uh, terms of business and productivity apps, or do you feel like it should be applied with social apps? You know, this, this big movement that's coming out is let's capture the eyeballs and monetize yep. later. Do you feel that more apps nowadays in trying to get their product out there should be freemium model, or what, what are your thoughts around that? Well, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm almost embarrassed to say mm -hmm. that I'm a big believer in the freemium model. And the reason I, I say that is, uh, you guys are younger than me, probably for the most part. But you know, back, you know, 14 years ago in the bubble, when Jeff Bezos was on the cover of Time magazine, it was like revenue no longer matters. It's basically eyeballs, and that seemed like you know heresy, and um, at the time. But you know, you really were getting rewarded for the eyeballs, not the revenue. And I'm basically, unfortunately or embarrassingly, <laughs> saying the same thing again. Um, again, you know, at the end of the day, we were you know we had a good revenue base as a company. Um, uh, but and you got to get to that. You have to have a revenue base ultimately. But you know you've got to build, uh, you know, momentum. And so clearly it's used in the consumer side. Um, but I've seen I've seen the you know the freemium to premium model used, I think, more smartly of late. I mean, back uh, just a couple years ago, sometimes you'd see people that they'd sell a they'd give a crippled version of their thing, a crippled version out for free, and. Um, that never made most sense. And what I mean by crippled version, if you had sort of 10 pieces of functionality, you'd only turn on six. And it made very little sense to me to sort of you know, give somebody only six of 10, basically give them a rotten experience and ask them to pay to get a good experience. That never works. So today you see increasingly people give the full 10, they just limit the number of times you can use it. But you want people to experience your app fully um, and you know, love it and then be delighted by it uh, and then they'll pay you for it. Um, but you know, obviously, there's all sorts of different models to how to how to skin that cat. Of course. So before we open it up to questions from the audience, I just want to ask: Is there any uh, other piece of advice, any any nugget of insight from all your experience that you would just offer to somebody who has uh, you know is building an app and just trying to get it out there, like in approaching partners and in, in, in trying to reach the end consumer? What, what would you tell them from all your years of experience that could help out? I guess a couple things, quick things come to mind. You know. The old thing on financing, you know, I'd rather be looking at the money than looking for the money. Uh, so, and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna burn through more money than you think you are, every time, every time. Um, the other side is, I was referring to this on those big brother partnerships. That first deal frequently is gonna look pretty grim from the financial terms. I mean, you'd be very fortunate if it didn't. And uh, I remember in that Nokia deal, uh, they put a liquidated damages clause in there that because they gave us source code because we were actually putting it into the stack if there was an unauthorized release of source code I think it was a liquidated damage of five million euros it was basically just you know the death penalty for us and we looked at it and we couldn't get them to change it and we sort of said you know we just said we got to do it because we needed that deal and the thing you know it would have been kind of mutual mutually assured destruction ultimately for them as well because they needed our stuff once we were embedded in there. So there is a tendency to fight for legitimate terms in that first deal, but you need that first deal. And so sometimes, you know, again, this is part of this whole velocity notion, is dealing with some grim terms early um, to win the things that are important late, like your brand, um, I think in hindsight were the correct decisions. Awesome. Awesome. So with that, we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, we have a microphone. Uh, and back, and we'll pass it around to anybody who has questions. Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> you guys so, are asking a ton of questions. Uh, you sold in 2012. Yeah. So, uh, first question is, why did Microsoft choose to be able to set this model up where they weren't in the game doing it themselves? Yep. Uh, and the other question is, when you sold, what was the reason for selling? Well, I mean, what's next, and why do you sell now versus? Yeah. Um, all right. So the first part, Microsoft. You know, why did Microsoft do this themselves? Um, you know, when when we when it was just a phone space, the principal use case was a viewer. There was very little editing done on uh, a smartphone. 
in the early years of smartphone world. And so it probably wasn't worth Microsoft's time to do it because in order for them to, you know, to move the needle at Microsoft, you need hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue and such. Um, so staying away from the market made sense. Now, when Microsoft had 90% of a given computing environment, when you'd only think about it from the PC perspective, um, you know, they still had that sort of almost monopolistic position. Now when you sort of factor in phone and tablet, and now their share falls to like less than 25%, um, it's critical for them to go cross-platform. So they, they have this sort of schizophrenic challenge where are they a platform company with Windows or are they a software company with Office and other applications. If you're a software company, you've got to go cross-platform. But that ongoing fight inside Microsoft tended to sort of side with Windows for years, up until Satya just, Satya just became the new CEO, and he said, we've got to go to where our customers are. You know, they, they sort of held, when they came out with Surface, they held back yet again, thinking it would, leaving, you know, client office on Surface would help Surface relative to iPad, and it really didn't. So, they had a lot of decisions to make that, you know, created an opportunity for companies like ours. Um, second question about, you know, why we sold, it was, we had already had commercial relationships with, Mike, with uh, Google. Um, we had done one in 2010, another one in 2011. Um, they had come to us about buying us. Uh, it was very compelling and a lot of things, you know, financially and all those sorts of things. Um, but I hesitated because I was having a heck of a lot of fun. I mean, things were really working well. And, you know, we were at an excellent revenue base, about 300 people. We were really, you know, kicking it. Uh, and I, I was always proud to say, you know, like in 2011, 82% of the days of the year, 82% of the days of the year, we were a top 10 highest gro grossing app in all categories, you know, uh, in iPad. So we were really doing well and I was having a lot of fun. But, you know, ultimately, I couldn't bound the Microsoft risk. People used to come up to me and say, Alan, no, you're, you're Quick Office, you're Microsoft Office on an iPad. And I used to say, well, we're more than that. But my worry was, what happens when Microsoft Office came to the iPad, which it did. So, um, Google's been a perfect partner for us because you know, now we're built into Chrome, both on the OS and the browser side. We're built into Android with KitKat, and you just saw the release today, we're built into Docs. So um, it's been a perfect match. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. I had a question on uh, a quote that you said. Uh, first of all, my name is Johnny Bash. I'm from Arizona. And oh, it's done. nice kind of having this intimate uh, interview. It's kind of cool. Good. Um, awesome. you, you said, who is it that said, um, it's not about monetization, it's about eyeballs. You said that was Amazon who said it was that? Bezos. On Bezos. On the cover of Time that. Magazine, like two, in year 2000. Yeah, so it's interesting. That was like a game changer. Everyone's like, what is this guy talking about? Yeah. And obviously, you know, look at, look at where he is today and look at the success of the company. And then immediately I think of companies like uh, Snapchat who are just like rampant with users. And now uh, they're starting to make innovation, you know, innovative steps towards monetization. But I think today still no monetization, right. but they do have stuff like, you know, watch EDC live. And now they're engaging huge amounts of users. What do you say towards companies like that uh, is the first question. The second question is what is that next like unbelievable uh, breakthrough, like just as if, you know, Bezos back in the day said it's not about monetization, it's about users. What, you know, tomorrow, what's gonna be the ridiculous statement we see on, you know, Times or, or TechCrunch or whatever that is just as, like, unbelievable or just as true moving forward? A great question. I'm not, I don't know if, if um, well, let me sort of answer with a couple of examples. So. If you think of the of this massive community Snapchat has built, and, and now they're thinking about monetization, but think of like the early days of LinkedIn. LinkedIn didn't know how it was going to monetize, and it sort of, you know, when it sort of, what is it like something like three quarters of LinkedIn's revenue comes from the recruiter side of the house. Um, uh, Viber, you know, I was just in Europe last week, and I was using Viber, and you know, Viber, uh, you know, it's completely free, but I could. Um, uh, and all these over-the-top solutions are free, you know. And um, I, I could sell some. I could um, I could buy some extra emoticons to you know <laughs> send crazy smiley faces. And those that's like the first introduction of of uh, of, of, uh, of payment. Um, in each of those instances, those companies you know built ma have built massive value based upon the size of their footprint and you know the number of engaged users. Um, and you'll find the the, the revenue model now. You know, 
you can't forget that at the end of the day, there has to be a revenue model. There has to be um, from someone. Uh, it may not be, you know, it may not be Snapchat as, a, as an individual company. It might be acquired by someone else who then can monetize those eyeballs somewhere. I mean, even look what Google does. I mean, Google has lots and lots of free services, but it monetized that with an ad, with a very unique ad model. So, um, you know, what's the next next? If it's not, if you're only going to get paid on, or if you're only going to get valued on eyeballs. Um, you know, I think it's interesting. It's like, it could be even some retrenchment before we get to the next next, because, you know, it wasn't long after Jeff Bezos was on the cover of Time Magazine, I think he was the man of the year or something like that, um, you know, that you had it all busted. And the valuations came, you know, cra crashing down and there was incredible illiquidity in the market and you couldn't raise money. Um, and, and it sort of returned to like, let's build real companies. And now the pendulum seems to go the other way yet again. And people have short memories and companies without revenue models are getting funded for astronomical sums. Um, you know, the only thing I know for sure is not all of them are going to come out the other end of that bottleneck as successful companies. So when, uh, when Microsoft introduced BPAWS and eventually Office 365, yeah. and it opened up SharePoint to quite a, quite a few SMBs that now had the opportunity to access their documents in the cloud, did you know? Did you guys do anything to to use that to help grow, or did it hinder the growth of the application that you guys offered? That's a great question. It didn't it didn't hinder us at all because in the early days of BPOS and then Office 365, Microsoft really had to protect the you know kind of the mothership of the Office franchise. So. Um, if you remember in the early days, you had you had an online viewer, but not the editor. Or then um, uh, the editor was very rudimentary, or the conversion of their own stuff, and the cloud was poor. You know, the fidelity was poor. So um, they were sort of dipping their toe in the water, and you know there was a lot of you know the, the data was noisy for us, but it concerned us as they were coming that way. Um, you know, they were trying to manage, or they continue to try to manage a move from perpetual use licenses to a subscription world without screwing up their revenue base because they got to report to the street and they've got, you know, so there's, it's really challenging for them to sort of, for them to disrupt themselves that way. Um, you know, we went out and we sort of saw this, you know, we, Sundar talked so much this morning about the multi-device world. We live in a multi-device world. You're going to begin work somewhere on one device and edit on the next. And it doesn't matter where you author and edit and vice versa. At the end of the day, you're just moving, you're moving uh, around devices and devices across multiple operating systems as well, generally. Um, and so we had developed a product that was a you know, cloud version or cloud stored version that was then pushed, like in the old BlackBerry push metaphor, down to the devices, trying to sort of develop a new product that we thought would stay ahead of everything. Okay. But again, what we came out with that right before the acquisition, so we, you know, so we'll never know how well it would have done. So, so I'd like to tap your knowledge base about startups and entrepreneurs and, and just in general about the marketplace. Um, I seem to have a penchant for finding opportunity and not knowing how to monetize it or not being able to identify the threats um, that I could be exposed to by entering that marketplace. So I'm curious, in your experience, how do you if you see an opportunity, if you know what, when, the, when, when it's right for someone to jump in the market, how do you know where that threat's going to come from? And can you tell me, give me any insight as to how to, uh, how to monetize something that you think is maybe a bigger player is going to enter the market and take that big piece of the puzzle out, out for small guys? Yeah, great question. I think um, as one entrepreneur, and I've done three, you know, three, I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur guy, so I've done three. Um, uh, and I think this applies to most entrepreneurs. I, it's not, the problem is not being late, the problem is being early. Uh, and quick office, we were early. So that, that's one sort of big risk. You're just out there and you see it, but the market takes a long time to develop. So that's a big threat. It, clearly, you've got, you know, you know, you know, when you start something, you rarely know how deep the hole is. You know, the idea seems really compelling. And, but you don't know until you get into it. And 
So you got to be really careful and really scrub the idea before you start spending real dollars doing it because you, you want to know how deep that hole is going to be. I, I, I was reminded not long ago, a guy came up to me with this incredible, crazy idea that he was going to do, uh, use drones to do uh, you know, aerial photography of farmland and then you know, algorithmically or whatever, they can come back and diagnose your crops in terms of, you know, and I thought, well, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. You know, I, it's not a world of living at all. Talk to a buddy of mine. So my point is about talk to experts. Talk to a buddy of mine whose venture firm focuses in agriculture. He's like, yeah, I saw three of those last week. So there's very few original ideas. You know, that was the point. There's very few. It blew me away. I was like, I never thought of something like that. And um, it just reminded me that there's very few original ideas. So it's, you know, it's how ripe the market is, how well you execute against it, making sure you've got enough money to do it. You know, the vast majority of us die because we run out of money. And so, you know, money is oxygen. You know, you, you got to have it. And so, um, you know, I don't think about the monetization immediately. I think about, you know, because it's not going to be profitable and immediately. Uh, I got to fund it. You know, and I'm, you know, I'll go through the angels and the whole bit to try to fund the thing. And also, a lot of people also, one, um, I have a big thing about phases of a business. It's another sort of thing I've lived with for a long time. You know, you go, I always talk about four phases of a business. So you have inception, commercial viability, um, repeatability of the model, and then scaling. I see people all the time in businesses in the inception phase, prototyping. They're spending lots of marketing dollars. It's a complete waste. As a matter of fact, it's counterproductive because you can win customers and then disappoint them on the experience because the product's not really commercially viable. So making sure that you stage your spend with the stage of your business or perhaps being slightly ahead of the stage. But all too often I see people you know, spending millions and millions of dollars on marketing when the business model or the product itself is not even developed. Uh, obviously, you're aware of the Uber, Airbnb phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? That exists. And uh, there's uh, obviously going to be a lot of other businesses that take from uh, the groupthink and the acceptance, yeah. the peer-to-peer -peer rating. Yeah. Uh, what do you see as opportunities in, in that space? Um, in sort of the shared, re the, shared, the shared resource economy, you're saying? Yeah, shared resource, crowdsourcing, peer-to-peer. Um, uh, evaluation. I, I think it's um, crowdsourcing to me is really powerful. I mean, all, all these um, this notion of shared resource. I mean, clearly Uber, Airbnb. I was looking at another one. Uh, a friend of mine was talking about today and uh, something else. But all on the shared resource notion um, is really interesting. I'm actually involved as a director of a company that um, is involved in crowdsourcing your contacts. You know, the idea is that, you know, again, so just think of it, think of it sort of um, conceptually. We have our contacts, and they sit in a digital database. Um, but they begin to decay because people move jobs and change phone numbers, things like that. So, you know, it goes, gets more and more obsolete over time. And there's no passive, automatic way in order to update your contacts. It's, it's as if you have something in a digital database that you tend to treat no different than an analog database, like it was business cards on a Rolodex. Um, so this crowdsourcing says, well, let's put it all together, and it's not like I'm going to give you someone else's contacts. I'm just going to give you back your contacts, but you, you from a machine learning out, you know, and algorithmically in the cloud, you go through and and have you know multiple versions of everyone's contacts, so they know Alan Masrick is no longer at Quick Office. Alan Masrick is now at Google. We've got the right guy, and his phone number has changed to such and such. So it's a way to update. Uh, people's information. So I think crowdsourcing is huge that way. Now you got to deal with privacy issues, but I, I think you're going to see more and more of that because it just makes sense. And it's just one example because I, I just think um, it's clearly a problem that has, that one example in context is clearly a problem that has to be solved and crowdsourcing is a good way to do it. I don't know if I answered your question. But... Okay, good, thank you. Seems like uh, since you sold, Microsoft has made a lot of advancements in your space. In addition to what was announced today, what do you think Google needs to do to remain competitive and continue to make an intent in this market? Um, I actually think um, 
Google's in a great spot right now, and I'm and I'm not uh, uh, I'm not just you know kind of waving the pom poms as a Google cheerleader. Um, I would I would be I would constructively criticize from before that the sharing model was better than Microsoft, in my opinion, before. It, it, the whole notion of the sharing model, real-time collaboration or not, just the whole notion of how you saved and, and, and interacted on documents was better. But for the longest time, the editing functionality, or first of all, the, the, the convert fidelity wasn't there in docs, sheets, and slides, and then the editing functionality wasn't there. And so you had to kind of go through, you know, what I mean that wasn't there, it wasn't kind of up to snuff and it wasn't offline, and it wasn't mobile, et cetera. Now, and so in a sense, you had to kind of go through an element of pain in order to get to the better sharing model. Now, the, the editing functionality is there. You saw track changes. You can stay in office mode with Quick Office. Um, it's offline. It's mobile. And it's got more than adequate editing functionality for the 95% of the users. So now you have, I, my opinion, an actually better solution. The better sharing model with more than adequate functionality on the editing side, you have a one plus one equals three situation. So I think continuing down that path, which I've been you know, pushing like crazy in the two years I've been there, uh, they'll continue to do that. And I think they will win a lot of business uh, in the enterprise app space. I really do. Awesome. So with that, uh, thank you so much for your questions, and thank you again to Alan. Uh, this was wonderful. Really My pleasure. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you.